growing up as a child, we never saw my dad. Whenever we asked mom, she would say he's working in the factory. So the girls, we were three sisters, we got brought up by my mother, a beautiful lady with so much strength, courage. She could single-handedly face any situation, in my opinion, and whose love for the arts and culture made me to join Indian classical dance and music from the age of five. It wasn't until I was a graduate when I actually got to find out what my dad really did and how he became successful. So he was a Form 4 graduate and he was a salesman in a shop selling clothes. And then one day, a grand uncle gave, loaned him some money. With that money, he bought a machine to make socks. So he made the socks, packed them, got into a matatu and traveled on safari around the country to sell the socks. He would sleep on sacks of potatoes, sacks of onions, because he didn't have the money to get a room for the night. He would do this for a couple of months, come home, and eventually he, made in, he saved enough money to upgrade, so he had now a machine to make cardigans. Did the same thing again packed them, got onto the matatu, went on safari, sold them. He continued doing this and eventually he became a really successful businessman and he had a huge textile factory in the 80s. And I believe my dad did all this because he wanted his girls to have what him and my mother could not have, a good education, a good life, to have money to afford goods and services. So when I was 16 years old, I was a topper in class. Um, I think the guys didn't really like that, but <laughs> I was always number one. And I knew I had this perfect plan in my head. I wanted to go to one of the best universities in the world. I wanted to get a job in one of the best financial institutions in the world. And I wanted to have a really nice house and an SUV. And I actually, in 97, graduated from the London School of Economics. I became an investment banker. <laughs> I worked at JP Morgan in London. The plan was working. <laughs> and then life happened. My mother got diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And the day I found out, I was sitting with her in the office, in the doctor's office, and he says, Mrs. Shah, I'm so sorry, you've got one year to live. So I just went the next day, and I resigned from this job, because I could only see my mother and her face. So I flew back home, and I got to spend... She was a tough one, as I said. She, did, she survived four years. And it was a very bittersweet four years for me and my younger sister and the family, obviously, my dad and everybody extended around. Um, it was bittersweet because you see your mum withering away every single day and at the same time you're so grateful that every single moment of those four years you could be around her. And in the end, her condition was such that she couldn't communicate at all. None of the muscles were working. The only thing she would do was blink her eyes and hope that my daughters would understand what I want. And the only nine days I left my mother in those four years was to go shop for my wedding. And while I was there, my father called and said, your mom's passed away. So I came back, obviously, for the funeral. And a few months later, the wedding that was supposed to happen got cancelled because he decided he didn't want to move to Kenya anymore and later on said, I, don't, I can't even wait for you anymore. So my life got fragmented into the most infinite pieces I can even imagine. And the person I loved the most in my whole world turned into ashes within a few minutes and she was the pillar of our family. Around that time, I got diagnosed with depression. 
So I was on antidepressants for three years. And at the same time, I was running a manufacturing plant, making pet bottles and hair braids. And I had to, I had to shut the, the, the business down because of my condition. And then one day, after three years, I woke up and I said, uh-uh, this is not me. I am stronger than this. So I weaned myself off the medication, and I did it very successfully. Around the same time, I came across an ad. I come across these ads quite often, like Engage. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I sit on Google, what do I do? I don't know. So I came across this ad saying, permaculture design course. First of all, whenever you say permaculture, everyone looks at you like, what is she talking about? It's basically um, a, a sustainable agricultural system. Let me just simplify, that's what it means. So it was in a village in Kitui. Pit latrines, cold water, no lights. So I decided I'm, I'm going to try permaculture. And I went there, and after two weeks, despite all the betting going on back home that she's probably going to come back within half a day, I survived, and I graduated with, with this course. And I was so lucky, I managed to work on a, on a design in Athi River at a children's home. I, I worked on the farm for six years, and I'm so proud of myself, actually, that today it's one of the plushest areas in that area. It feeds organic food to 200 children, and it has about 600 trees. So, while working in, with, with the nature, the farm, the food, it rekindled the passion for food in me. I'm actually a real foodie, if, if my, my family knows that. Um, and I decided I need to do something. I, need, I had this dream, this vision, I still have it, it's to open some, uh, a very healthy option for a farm-to-fork concept sometime in, in the near future in Kenya. So I, I decided to go to New York, and I trained as a vegan vegetarian culinary chef. <laughs> I stayed in New York for one year, and like Willis, Times Square. <laughs> I passed Times Square every single day of my life for that one year, and I said, one day I too shall be that famous restaurantpreneur, if there's a word like that. <laughs> and um, I finished the year and I came back, and then I went on holiday with my father, who's also a foodie. I think it runs in the family. And uh, it was a beautiful vacation. And then one day in the morning, my dad's a real early bird, so I went down and I waited. He didn't come up, so I thought, that's a bit strange. Dad's always early. So I went up to his room, and um, he was nicely sleeping, so I opened the curtains, and then I um, opened the in-dining room menu, started reading it. It was about five minutes. I was just chatting away. No response from my father. So I kind of like shook him. Still no response. So I got a little nervous, and I touched his face, and it was ice cold. My dad was not breathing. So although my mind was like, okay, I don't think dad is breathing, my heart was like, no, 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 no. So I know resuscitation, I was trying that, didn't really work, so I screamed the loudest I think I have ever screamed in my life, and I got some help from the hotel staff. We wrapped my dad in this white hotel bed sheet, carried him in the car, took him to the nearest hos ho hospital, only to be told he is no more. I was in Mumbai in this, I have no clue. What, what am I supposed to do in Mumbai? And he died in a hotel room, so they thought, we need to investigate. So I remember sitting almost 10 hours in this police station, just sitting there, until they gave me the clearance to take my father out of the hospital. And I remember sitting in this ambulance with this, Siren just going so loud at 2 a.m. in the morning. I haven't eaten anything, I haven't drunk anything. All I want to do is take my father home. And I remember coming to this dark, dingy alley, and it's the stench. Oh my God, it was awful. But that was where the undertaker was. And I had to leave my father in this cheap wooden coffin with the white cloth. 
So it's been three and a half years since my dad passed away. And I've been involved in litigation. So it doesn't happen only in the Karumis. It happens in the Shahs. <laughs> and my life has kind of been in, on a standstill right now because of the litigation. I, I can't really do much. I fear even traveling out of the country because I feel when I come back, I may not even have a roof. But there's one real good thing that I have in my life is my sister, Dee. She is smart, she is artistic, and she is the practical one. And she has stood by me all my life, and she stood by me, especially these last three and a half years. And I think without her support, I wouldn't be able to do all the things that I do do. I've seen both my parents turn to ash, and to me, because I'm into agriculture, topsoil. <laughs> And I, too, shall be topsoil one day. But I feel I'm going to give it my best shot. And I'm going to get, I'm going to achieve my dream. I'm going to give it my best shot. And even if I don't get to where I want to be, I'm going to, I know that I gave it my best. And I tried. And I'll be really happy um, with that. And I would like to leave my footprints for the future generation in my family. And with that, I would like to end by saying something which I actually have on my Facebook profile. <laughs> it's basically, life is not merely to survive. You need to thrive, but you need to do it with some love, with some compassion, with some, with some humor, with some style. Life is beautiful. Thank you.